Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the Saturday edition of Let's Talk with me, Julie Ali. Please keep me company till 10 o'clock because you're going to be in for a treat. We have the delightful Tariq Uwais Malinga, the Nasheed artist, the popular Nasheed artist that's going to come in and talk about his journey in the world of Nasheeds and is also going to be singing live on the show so that's something you don't want to miss we'll be looking at purposeful living with neurofeedback practitioner she is lisa maritz and we're going to find out how that can change your life but first up are we raising a nation of helpless children rather than helpful children. To talk to us about this issue, and I think it's close to all of our hearts, is a social worker, Mahlatsi Diale from JP Triple C. Good morning, welcome to the show. Good morning, Julian, thank you for having me. Lovely to have you here because we're talking something very important. Uh, but first up, tell us what is JP Triple C? Um, JP Triple C is the Johannesburg Parent and Child Counseling Center. We provide counseling services and assessment for children, for families and children across the city of Joburg. And we also provide therapy and play therapy at um, schools around Johannesburg. Is the issue around lazy children, children that have a almost uh, have this feeling of entitlement um, their parents owe it to them because they didn't ask to be born so they want all the privileges in life and they want things to be done for them is that uh, very pervasive in our society these days yeah i think we're starting to see that coming out a lot with our children Julie, and I think it's because sometimes parents aren't that intentional about how they want their kids to come up. And if that happens, then the children learn that actually I can be demanding and pressure my parents to want this and that, and also looking at what their friends have. And that's where the challenges are coming from. And if parents don't give in to the children, um, would you say that's when they become delinquent because that's the way they rebel? And that's the way to get attention from the parents. I think for children to actually get to that point, there are other issues that are uh, underlying to that problem. However, I mean, in some instances, you would see children that maybe would become, you know, would start to steal from their own parents to get certain things that they want because they feel like they know their parents have the money. and. They, they feel that their parents are refusing to get them the stuff that they want or need and they'll take the money from home and that frustrates parents a lot. However, if parents are intentional and actually have certain discussions with their children, then those children are more likely to be understanding and more compassionate also to the, towards their parents instead of um, just pushing through to what they want and what they feel they need. We're talking children, we're talking about helplessness of children. And yes. I know that all of the questions and the responses from you is age appropriate. Yes. So we're talking now and a parent of a two-year-old child shouldn't necessarily expect and perhaps instill uh, disciplinary measures which we may cover in the program. Mm -hmm. So everything would be age appropriate. But earlier on you did say that... Um, before a child reaches the point of delinquency, there are other issues that um, needs to be uncovered. Um, things that have happened in the home or possibly with this child. Yes. And that kind of suggests problems in the family. What would they be? And I know it's a very, very, it's very generalized, yes. but some of the main characteristics that parents should kind of look out for and not repeat those mistakes. 
Okay. I think we're looking at how do you model it to your children. Um, if you're saying one thing to your children but you're behaving another way, your children actually pick that up. How do you relate to your husband or to your own parents in the home? Because those are the things that children pick up. If you are demanding to your own parents as a grown-up adult and complain about what your parents don't do to you for you, then that's something that your children are picking up and are learning from you. So they'll certainly follow that pattern. In this generation, I've often heard it, and I probably am guilty as a parent myself. Mm -hmm. We often remind our children how fortunate they are because we didn't have everything they have yeah. when we were little. We had to work very hard to get a few privileges or not have them at all yeah. because our parents were poor or working class parents yeah. and we were obviously growing up in the dark days of apartheid yeah. so things were even that much more difficult. Those type of sentiments that we express in the presence of our children or tell them about it, yeah. is it doing them any good? Or is it just making them feel more privileged and more uh, expecting more and more from us? Mm -hmm. I think it depends on how you do it. I think it is important to make your children aware that they have things that you didn't necessarily have. But I think it's also important to show it in a way that you want them to appreciate what they have, not to make them feel guilty about what they have. And because it's important for children to appreciate what they have because when they do, then they'll take better care of it, then they'll be more responsible. Instead of guilt tripping them, then they think <laughs> that, you know, they, there's, a, there's a tug of war, then they're battling and then they feel like you're blaming them for the hardships that you went through and then they stop caring, they stop listening at that point. They just tune uh, out. Yes, basically. But if you tell them, you know, I didn't have this and this and I want you guys to have this because I want you to live a different life, I want you to have opportunities that I didn't have and help them to learn to appreciate what they have. Teach them to take care of the little or the much that they are having so that they grow up learning to appreciate it so they can also pass that on to their own children so that it's not an entitlement issue. It's I have good things, therefore I take care of them. We're often told that raising children or being a parent doesn't come with a how-to guide. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to be sensible about how you raise your children mm -hmm. and kind of follow your gut and look around you at good role models. Easier said than done. Yeah. But as a social worker and as working at JPCCC where you do a lot of uh, parenting and family counselling as well. What are the key issues or the key um, top three or top five issues that you believe parents should kind of prevent, avoid uh, in raising dysfunctional families? The things that we shouldn't do or the things we should be doing to raise, you know, perfectly mm -hmm. sound families. Okay, I'd say the things that you should do, I think is number one, be intentional about the things that you want your children to learn from a very young age. It becomes more difficult Give when us they're examples. older. So by being intentional, is by creating like a sort of a routine or saying before even you have those children to say, okay, I'd like my children to be responsible. What does that mean to you? Because if you know what you want, then you know what to show your children what is expected of them. From a young age, for example, a two-year-old, you can teach a two-year-old, now, after you've played with your toys, let's put them back, and you make it a game, because at that age, everything is a game for them. But if they feel like they're pressured, or it's a scary experience, or you're frustrated, then they don't they learn it up on that. Yes. Your impatience and your frustration. Exactly. And they don't learn it appropriately. But if it's a fun thing, then they learn actually cleaning up a after myself it's an important thing and it's actually a fun thing to do then they grow up enjoying part of being disciplined it's discipline is about teaching your children what is expected of them and how to live their lives in a way that will help them in the future and when they learn that and they know it's a good thing instead of it always coming when they've done something wrong then it's it's a fear and it's an impose and it's an imposition that you're imposing on them but if it's fun and it's part of you know the structure and the the life that you're setting out for them, then they learn it as part of growing up, like the way they would learn how to walk or talk. So it's normal. 
We've also been told that corporal punishment is now a crime, yeah. um, very definitely not in schools. Yeah. But what about in, uh, in the home, mm -hmm. in the home environment? Let's assume a child's been really, um, uh, you know, negligent or has uh, kind of flouted all the rules of discipline mm -hmm. and you need to instill some values in him. Uh, how do you feel and how do you view corporal punishment in the home, a couple of slaps maybe, <laughs> or a couple of, um, I don't even know what they refer to it anymore, yeah. canings on the backside. Yes, yes. What's the, what's the, what does the law say about that and mm. what's your view about that? Okay, I think looking at our country as a whole, I mean generally we grew up with corporal punishment and we knew that as part of a normal, you know, childhood is that when you do something wrong then you'll get a hiding. And because of the abuse that has been happening, um, the government decided to, dis to, to protect children, so to speak, and to say, let's take this out. Because truly speaking, corporal punishment doesn't necessarily bring in discipline. It's supposed, it was supposed to be a tool you're using to discipline your child. So if it what is a tool... What does it do? Make them rebellious? <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. If you're using it as a tool for discipline, it can be effective. But if it's a tool, it can be replaced with something else because you're not teaching your child that if I beat you, you'll listen to me. You're teaching your child that I'm giving you a hiding so that next time you'll listen to me. So what is it that you can do alternatively if that tool is now taken away from you? Because you're not using discipline to say you will maybe study harder. You're saying, I want you to study harder because that's a good thing. So if you're not studying or you're not doing something that is expected of you, what is an alternative way of actually making you remember that this is important? Taking away your cell phone or whatever oh. else that is important <laughs> to the child. Right, because right. it's not the pain of being hit that is important, it's the lesson that the child learns right, right. out of it. So it's and difficult. obviously taking away privileges, yes. I, I should imagine, is more painful because as a parent, when you're beating up on your child, mm -hmm. that must be very, very difficult for you as well. Mm -hmm. I, I, mean, I can't ever remember having beaten up on, on my children mm -hmm. and I can't watch any parent doing sure. it to their children. I hate it. I think it's, it is so uncivilized. <laughs> but yeah. Let's go for an ad break. We'll be okay. back in a minute or two. I'm talking to the lovely Matlati Diale. She's from JP Triple C and we are talking about children. Are we raising a nation of helpless or helpful children? You, the parent, you need to decide on that. the all-important question this morning with Matlatsi Diale from JP Triple C, the Johannesburg Parent and Child Counseling Center. They are in Bramfontein, Johannesburg, and we are talking about children. Are we raising helpless or helpful children? Let's see if we can get an answer to that question. Would it depend on your socio-economic situation? Would it depend on the type of school you go to? Would it depend whether you're privileged or not? Um, do you think all of those issues would play a role in raising the perfect child or the perfect children? I think ultimately it looks, it goes back to the parent, Julie, because the reason people parents become overprotective and do things for their kids and give them this sort of sheltered life, whether you are poor, um, privileged or very wealthy, it goes down. It's fear, you know. Parents want to give their children the best out of life. They want to protect them. They don't want their children to struggle. And that's where the challenge comes, is because in life we never sheltered off challenges. And if your children don't learn how to deal and manage through little challenges as children, then when they become adults, they become helpless, mm -hmm. you know, even as teenagers especially, because that's a time in their lives where a lot of things become very difficult. 
let's look at issues that are going to impact on the helpless child, mm -hmm. very especially in those torrid teenage years, because they could go either way. Yeah. They could go completely off the track or they could remain on track and become very responsible citizens. Mm -hmm. so let's true. look at all of those scenarios. Okay. So, for example, if a child is feeling helpless, especially in those very pressured teenage years where it's school and parents are expecting and teachers are expecting them to work hard because everybody is looking at what's going to happen when you're an adult, um, what kind of job are you going to have. If children haven't learned how to navigate through those challenges, they may become very depressed, very anxious, which may lead to either suicidal thoughts, um, mm -hmm. taking in of drugs, or be just becoming generally rebellious and doing those things that parents wonder, how did my child get into this place, you know? And now we're looking at a helpless child that gets into these very difficult life situations, yes. which probably pushes them into suicide ideation or possibly even to start experimenting and then becoming hooked on drugs. Yeah. How could parents have helped them mm -hmm. out of that very torrid situation? What could they have done differently for them not to reach that point? Mm -hmm. Because at that point too, peer pressure is all important. Mm -hmm. They've tuned the parent out and they idolize their peers That's and true. hang on to every word the peer says. Mm -hmm. I think we'll go back to the thing that I said, pen, parents need to be intentional and from a young age. Because when a child is coming from a very safe and secure home and the parents have also set a good example, it becomes easier for the child to come home and say, I'm struggling with this. Because they know mommy also has struggles and they know mommy has to overcome certain struggles. So it doesn't become as overwhelming because going through challenges is normal. And I think parents need to also acknowledge that, you know what, school is difficult and I don't always know the answers that you're asking me. But it doesn't mean you have to give up. It doesn't mean it, that it won't get better. But helping your child navigate through the difficulties and, you know, sometimes being able to be sad and maybe crying or just going, taking your child for ice cream and say, OK, this is sad, let's just talk about it, but also going back and say, OK, now let's work. Let's put in the work, let's try and improve. What can we take away that will allow you to focus on what needs to be focused on? Because sometimes cell phones are what's making your child struggle in school. So can your child... Put it away. If not, you take it away for them. Not to punish them, but as a way of instilling a sense of discipline and allowing them to, you know, to focus, so to speak. I want to look at a scenario of when you're doing a parent and child counselling, yes. but we'll come to it in a minute or two. Okay. I'd just like to apologise to the caller there. Najma, my producer, was trying to give us a... a, a, a a question from a caller but unfortunately the line was very very bad and I couldn't get any of the questions so my apologies uh, for that Najma and the caller. Back to you. Uh, when you are in a situation of counselling mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'm just wondering if the child doesn't think that you're leaning towards the parent or vice versa mm -hmm. and when that happens they're not going to buy into the process. Okay, so when we go, we take a child for counselling, we look at how old they are and we do certainly meet with the parents first because we kind of need to figure out what the problems are and sometimes we end up suggesting that the parent also comes for their own therapy because usually it's not just the child alone that's having a challenge and when we help the whole family then the child can go back also to a healthier environment. And most of the time, the children actually love just having their own space. Mm -hmm. And they kind of like sort of forget about their parents or what their parents want from them. Generally speaking, children and preteens yes. are very reluctant as far as therapy or counseling is concerned because they almost view it as, I'm not okay, mm -hmm. that is why I have to go for counseling. Mm -hmm. um, there's got to be something wrong with me and it impacts on the self-esteem issues. Mm -hmm. How do you broach that issue? Mm -hmm. In helping that child believe that he or she is okay, mm -hmm. the self is, you, you let them walk away with self-esteem absolutely intact, mm -hmm. knowing that that child's going to become a helpful child <laughs> and a helpful adult? That's a very good question because it does happen a lot where 
kids feel like either they're being punished by being sent to therapy or yeah like you said oh, there's stupid. something I'm wrong stupid. with them. there's something yes. wrong with me the great thing about that age group is that they they're very understanding and they're able to ask the questions that they you know they have mm -hmm. if they don't and they mm -hmm. still kind of hold on to those thoughts are you able to pick up on it and break through and get this very important message across to them okay so generally in our first sessions with a child we do ask them why they think they had come they were sent or they had come for counseling and we ask them what are the things that they find challenging ah. in life so we do explain what counseling is about and you know we let them ask questions so that they are fully aware of you know the process there and what we do you know and we explain more what we do as opposed to what you know mom wants fixed about them and over time because generally with with counseling it doesn't work out that <laughs> after the first session they're happy with you mm -hmm. it usually happens that after maybe two or three sessions the children start warming up and they actually love that space because mm -hmm. it's their space you're Absolutely. talking to them you're talking to things to them about things that are important to them and i think that's what helps you don't get there and be like your mommy wants you to do this and this why don't you do this <laughs> and it's it's only then that the child starts opening up because you're focusing on them you're focusing on how they feel on what's important to them and their friends and how they're experiencing their world here's a lovely question um, from the listener what happens when you marry an adult who was raised helpless as a helpless child <laughs> where everything was done for him or her mm. what's this product that we're looking at and how difficult is that relationship going to be sure being married to somebody who is a helpless adult that can Terrible. be very very exhausting emotionally and physically because this person will probably expect everything around them to just happen and it will be very frustrating to the partner and usually you find that they also don't know how to deal with conflict so you'll get frustrated and try and confront them about the things that they are not doing and they don't even know how to deal with that then they also switch off so it can be a very challenging and very difficult you know, living space to be in. And it's also impacting on your children as well. And they're also learning from dad that, oh, okay, I don't need to do stuff. And if, you know, mommy wants dad to do stuff, daddy switches off or daddy walks away or daddy, you know, just completely gets angry or whatever it is that they, how they react. And that's react. very important because the majority of people who are unable to resolve conflict mm -hmm. Um, end up having a furious, having a meltdown or a horrible screaming match mm. or becoming very, very angry. Mm. And the anger is really because they're helpless mm. in having to deal or resolve a conflict and they don't know how. It's true. Um, any quick tips in how one can start the process mm -hmm. in resolving conflict in a respectful manner? I think if it's rooted at childhood, it's very important for people to go for therapy because you'll have to go down back to the root and help people learn that this is actually not okay because they haven't learned that their whole lives. And quite possibly they don't understand why their wives or their significant other or even their colleagues are not understanding you know where they're standing and they don't understand how the other person necessarily feels because and because they can't verbalize and they're not being understood yes they then have they become horribly angry exactly. and throw their toys out the cot mm. and become defensive as well because absolutely they're feeling attacked mm -hmm. mm. absolutely uh, not realizing that their uh, their response or their reaction is frightening the people around mm. them so you know imagine cool. someone having a meltdown or going to a fit of rage mm. Mm. how frightening mm. that is to all the people be it your spouse or yeah. your children yes, definitely. it's a horrible spectacle to be exposed to mm. that being said we're almost at the end of the interview okay. let's look at a perfect example of a helpful child mm -hmm. and what their future is going to look like okay i think I without being taken advantage <laughs> of because i think yeah. helpful people are being taken advantage of possibly i think being a helpful child is not just about you know being good to other people but also knowing how to be good to yourself so it also ah. means you know how to set good boundaries because 
being too helpful is also on another side of the spectrum. It's the opposite end. It's not helpless, but it's feeling like I'll be helpless if I don't help others. And or that's when I'll be accepted or I'll be liked exactly, if, if, I'm I'm do, if, if I help people all the time. Yes, most definitely. So that's on the other end of the spectrum, as opposed to in the middle, where you are healthy, where you know how to set uh, good boundaries, where you know how, when to say yes and when to say no. And that's when we say, okay, this is a healthy individual. This is somebody who can be happy with their big and their small successes. We can be happy when others are successful and be sad when others are sad as well. And that's the... And very sadly, people who are helpful all the time very mm. definitely do get taken advantage of. Yes, because definitely. if they don't know how to say no, mm. people are going to expect of them all of the time and just exhaust them. Mm. And at mm. some point, they're going to break down. Mm. They will definitely <laughs> burn out. And they won't even probably not yes. also understand why. Mm. Because mm. they want to be helpful. They want to be accepted. They want to be loved. You know, and who doesn't? But yep. they, they, there's an unhealthy part They give of too that much of well. themselves. Yeah. In closing, your final words to our viewers on the part of the helpless and the part of the helpful child. Okay. I think for the parents, I'd say be intentional if you want to raise help for children and if you're finding that your children are very helpless or you find it difficult to actually put the measures to help your child be um, helpful and you just feeling helpless yourself, get help, get help for your children and learn how to do it differently. Thank you indeed, Matlati. It's been lovely talking to you. It was a very, very uh, useful interview because it's brought a few things to, to light, not only for myself, but I think to the general public as well. Um, and I think one of the things we as parents do trip up on is that we give too much of ourselves, mm. thinking that we're showing our children that we love them. Mm. And love doesn't necessarily mean giving too much. Mm. It's about setting boundaries. Awesome. Thank you indeed. Thanks and that's you. where we leave the interview with Matlati. She's from JP Triple C and she has been talking about how to raise helpful children as opposed to helpless children. And welcome back. We now have Lisa Moritz in studio and she has a practice called Brain Harmonics. And it's all about neurofeedback uh, uh, practices. Uh, she comes from a psychological background. She also has a BA in social sciences. And I kind of, when I looked at this issue, brain harmonics, I kind of wondered just how fuzzy is this? But the fact that she comes from a psychological background herself, um, I believe lends credibility to this concept. Good morning. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. And with due respect to you regarding the intro, sure. when people come across neurofeedback and brain harmonics, they kind of wonder about the authenticity or the workability of things like this. Yes. But you as, um, you know, a, a, a social uh, scientist and a psychologist, what is it that, before we get into the nitty gritty of what okay. exactly this practice is, what is it that drew you to this modality and made you decide to open up your own practice? Um, I should first state that um, it's, I'm not a psychologist. I just have the bachelor's degree so that people don't confuse You're not a practicing psychologist. No, no. Okay. Um, but I, I wrote for a women's magazine and one of the articles that I got to do was about neurofeedback. Um, and the more I got into the researching about it, um, the more I realized that this is something that needs to you know, be practiced. People need to know about this. Um, it's actually very well known overseas. Um, it started in America in 1965, I Ooh. believe. Yeah, so it's been around for many decades and research is actually very um, robust and, and it is ongoing constantly. It's just a little unknown. Um, so basically when I did my research for the article, I realized that this is something I have to be a part of um, because you actually get to 
change people's lives um, by doing something scientific but in a natural way, which is obviously the best way, I, I, I believe, yeah. Has it changed your life? Because it, oftentimes when we embrace a new concept or a new modality, yes. um, we're not going to be able to sell the concept mm. onto other people For sure. if we haven't experienced it ourselves. I agree. I agree with you fully. It actually has. Um, at the time that I was uh, approaching this project, um, I was really depressed. Um, I was really struggling to keep head above water. I just had my youngest son. So it was really a, um, an effort for me to get through every day. Um, but this has helped me to such an extent. Um, my emotions stabilized. I was a lot more calm. Um, I was able to sleep at night with having a baby in the house and your um, sleep constantly interrupted. It, it wrecks havoc. So I was able to fall back asleep after feeding. Um, things like that it was magical. I started remembering things clearer oh, wow. it was really amazing one of the best um, results was that I was able to not be as irritated with my kids which we um, sometimes get when we're so involved in just coping you know so that was great I was able to start enjoying my children better and, and as a result their reaction to me was better as well so it has when we look at um neurofeedback um, and you're going to unpack it for us. Yeah. How is this different um, as opposed to going to maybe a life coach, uh, practicing CBT or NLP, yeah. um, you know, or any other counseling session? For sure. Because we know that in this frenetic life of ours these days, we need that added support in being the best version of ourselves. I couldn't agree more. So where and how does this fit into the big picture? Um, how does it compare with the modalities that I've just uh, talked to you about? So the main difference is that we don't do counseling. We don't, um, we don't deal with the current problems that people have. We actually go to the root of the problem. We go to the brain waves and how the brain functions in real time. So that influences everything that we do, how we experience life, how we deal with life. So if those pathways are not um, optimally functioning, we cannot function optimally. So that's what we do. We go to the inside and we get the brain to really pulse the way it's meant to so that we can deal with whatever is happening in life better. So all these other modalities that you, you just spoke about really has um, a lot of benefits. But if you and the way you function is not optimal. It's really going to be much harder for these um, modalities to get to the root of your problem and help sort it out. So basically, if you are, are blocking things, they can't do their work properly. So that's what we do. We go to the inside and we get the basics better again so that you don't have all these walls, you don't have all these obstacles preventing you from being your best self. Okay, I'm a very cynical person. Go ahead. You respect of course. To you. No, of course. Um, I'm kind of wondering, what happens if I come into a session with you for this brain harmonics or neurofeedback yes. and I kind of will myself to resist everything that you're putting mm. me through, the exercises yes. or the modality. So what's going to happen then, number one? And number yeah. two, what exactly is happening? Is this a, a piece of machinery, equipment? Okay. Uh, because you're talking brain pathways, sure. clearing the pathways. Yes. Um, it's nothing invasive, I no. hope. Not at so all. So talk me through that, okay. the issue, you know, how, mm. uh, what the, cons the consult looks like. For sure. Am I going to be hooked up? to any equipment or machinery and what if I will myself to resist. Yeah. So you can do that and I would then never recommend that you come. Um, for the <laughs> for the basic reason why would you want to waste your time? You yes. know? The people who come to me normally come to me when they've tried everything else and they are really desperate for change. Um, so they want to change. That is a very important um, part of the process because you can resist your brain not doing what what we encourage it to do and that would be such a massive waste of time and money right but yes you can um, if you we do it long enough eventually your brain will try the new things that we encourage but 
Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it at all. So if parents bring their teenagers and they, they have no interest whatsoever, I'd not recommend them bringing their kids, you basically. You must buy into it. Like you said, you must want to you change. You must want to change. That's mm -hmm. the thing. It's it's really, if you, if you are not open to things changing, it won't. You okay, know? let's talk about the changes that you're referring to. Yeah. But just before we get to those changes, I'm thinking also maybe illnesses, maybe mm. a mental block, yeah. and a whole host more which you're going to share with us. Yes. What's going to happen in the... Uh, in the con uh, in the consultation process sure. with you. So the first step is always an assessment. So what we do is we use e EEG elect um, electrodes and we use the um, technology of EEG and specific and up to date software to measure brainwave frequency. So basically, you will be hooked up with electrodes but it functions only as recorders so it just records your brainwave functioning so nothing goes into the head at all it is 100 percent no safe. microwaves nothing, nothing <laughs> at all it's like basically the way i explain it to people is like when a doctor listens to your heart with a stethoscope you don't feel anything but he can hear what's happening it's kind of the same thing we just put the electrode and the machine captures what it it picks up so you don't feel anything you don't know anything is happening it's just yeah you just feel we put it on and that's it um, so basically the assessment involves us putting you through a series of um, changes so we'll have you have eyes closed and then we measure how your brain waves pulse at that site where we ever we put it when your eyes are closed then we'll have you open your eyes and then basically mimic when you are restful what your brainwaves do and then we'll put you in a task we'll I'll give you something to do and then we see what your brain does when you're busy working or um, concentrating so during each of these things different brainwaves should be dominating and they should be changing and they should go from left to right in your head different things should be happening all over your head so the first step is just gathering all of this data so we can see what your brain is doing then we identify. And how long does that first step the, take? The measurement takes about 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes. And then once we have all the data gathered, I'll give uh, verbal feedback. So I can tell you, look, this is what's happening in the front of your head when you're concentrating. This is what's happening in the back. This is what's happening from left to right when you try to recall okay, I'll, information. <laughs> I want examples of that, but let's go for an ad break first. No problem. I'm talking to Lisa Maritz. We're talking neurofeed. She is a neurofeedback practitioner. She has a business or a practice called Brain Harmonics and she's based in Johannesburg. We're talking to a neurofeedback practitioner. Her name is Lisa Maritz, and we've been talking off air. Sounds absolutely fascinating. So talk us through that process. You're suggesting that if the brain, the picture shows you that the waves are not uh, functioning the way they should be functioning, yeah. you then help correct that. Um, how would you know how the brain or those waves should be functioning? So it's definitely decades and decades of research and fine tuning and everything that has brought us to a place where we can with confidence say that in the front of your head, for instance, when you're concentrating, we need more beta waves functioning. So we can say if there are sleep, sleep waves or the theta or delta waves active in the front of your head, it means that you can't concentrate properly. Oh. So for instance, it's it's the benefits of years of research that have brought us to this point. So we can basically pinpoint things that are, are happening with your brain waves that are making it harder for you to function the way you should. Um, just to name one or two examples, for instance, if you have slow frequencies in the front of your head when you're concentrating, it means that you have that foggy feeling in your head, that you always feel sleepy when you're trying to concentrate and focus, and that makes it hard. It makes it hard to take in information, makes it hard to get your tasks done, things like that. And something that we, most of us actually struggle with is having proper sleep. So when our brain is too busy in the back of the head, it means that when we sleep, our brains 
are active the whole night with the wrong kind of frequency. So instead of slowing down and processing, our brain is busy and planning. So it's just a few examples of what can happen what with brain What about if I'm the type of client that has several issues? For example, um, can't sleep while at night because yes. the back of my brain is overly active. Yes. Uh, and number two, I'm very forgetful. So I'm Probably even thinking people with um, uh, Alzheimer's, will this help them? It can. How does you know? How do you kickstart the process? And then, um, would it pick up issues around diseases, dreaded diseases? Is it able to pick it up and perhaps help in directing you to get the right help? Or how does that all work? Okay, so basically, neurofeedback doesn't diagnose any medical issues okay. we have what we call markers so we can see whether you have for instance depression markers that is not a diagnosis of depression but it means that your brain waves are making it hard for you to cope with things the way you should we have ADD markers we have Alzheimer's markers wow. but it doesn't mean that we are saying you are going to get Alzheimer's but we can say look your brain's not in the best place memory wise and we can do something about it to help maybe prevent a full person with full-blown Alzheimer's are you able to intervene at this point and help them recover yeah. uh, or, or turn and the condition around to a certain extent it's really hard to say because each person is different and it depends on the damage already done and it depends on the reason why it's there you know if it's because of any kind of lifestyle issues over time or because of stress or traumas it all depends we'll have to do an assessment first to see where it's at and then say how it can possibly help there are no guarantees that it can turn anything around but it certainly can help to improve lifestyle um, not lifestyle quality of life in most cases and so even if we can't reverse Alzheimer's we can for instance help them to sleep better and be less anxious uh -huh. for instance and not be as angry or frustrated things like that so we can help but not necessarily um, take it away and the same with anything else you know it's it's basically getting the brain to to do whatever it needs to do better and that will filter into a lot of factors in your life but we can't ever guarantee that it will take anything away unfortunately you know not everything is caused by brainwave imbalances okay so we're talking brainwave imbalances That's here and exactly. you through this process um, allows the client or assist the clients in rebalancing yes so once that initial graph is done how many sessions would the client have to come to to be good to go again and how would you know would, would the brain okay. waves tell you that it's okay does it just take one session no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so each person is obviously individual and different so when we get the assessment we can see what's happening and and according to that we'll recommend certain amounts of hours of training so for most people that can differ from 12 hours to 20 hours and even more sometimes depending on what's going on right so we call what we do then an intensive so what you asked earlier what if you have several things happening that's the beauty of this because we try to balance the whole brain and all the brain waves that are impairing your life so we can address so many things at the same time and you'll pick up all of those issues so let's assume i don't sleep well i'm an overly anxious person i'm an angry person you may be stuck in patterns I'm, and bite your I'm, nails yes, or i'm a depressed person yes um, so i've got four or five different issues going on yes. with me will that uh, assessment give you a total picture yes. of everything that needs to be yes. uh, addressed that's the point is trying to then address everything what is the point of only working on your sleep if you're still going to be depressed or what is the point of having you concentrate better but you're still unhappy you know so it's always better to get everything best and um, better so let's go to a step two mm. so now you've got a picture of what my situation is and I need to go for training five that's what you refer to yeah. it as training five sessions of training how long do they take mm. what's the process involved okay. there? so the process is very easy basically what we do is we'll try and get all the hours that you need done within a seven to ten day period the reason is the quicker we can get it done the more solid and enduring the new brain waves will be so 
we try not to stretch it over a long period of time because then we'll need more training to get it nice and solid. The point is to leave you with a whole new network of brain waves. Um, so seven to 10 days normally, and you can do up to four hour sessions a day. So depending on your schedule, you can break it up into different sessions. So people will come in, they'll be on a nice recliner, they'll be on a, um, they'll be leaning back, they'll be relaxed, we'll have a nice darkish room. Um, we put the electrodes on and basically it still goes through to the computer. A similar situation. Exactly. But then instead of just reading the, pro the brain waves, we link it to different programs. So what the magic is, is the programs turn your brain waves into something like music, for instance, and we let you listen to your brain waves. So you constantly listen to how your brain is functioning. So for instance, we are letting the beta waves um, function um, and then you will hear for instance piano sounds so you just listen your eyes are closed you listen to piano sounds and every time your beta waves calm down for instance you will hear a bell sound so you will lean back you will listen and then your brain will say when I hear that bell sound it makes me feel good what did I do to get that sound? And then it calms down again and creates the um, reward. So it sounds, sounds fascinating, but what other additional work needs to be done by me to make sure that my brain waves then remain in this very yeah. healthy position? Do you give me any paperwork, any literature to go home and read, any exercises, anything? Or is it just this magical machine that does <laughs> all the work? It sounds magical, but it really isn't. The, the, you don't need to do any additional exercises or anything. Or like change I said, your thinking. Look, it will kind of happen by itself because all of a sudden, or over time, and it's a, it's sometimes a very subtle process, but you will just automatically start feeling more calm. And then you will react more calmer to whatever is happening around you, to the stress that you uh, endure. So things kind of happen by itself. It helps if you are consciously aware. Of course it does. Um, it helps if you are invested in the, in the program. So you say, look, I feel happier. So let me do something that makes me happy. So you enforce it basically, but you don't have to do specific ABC things. What is important though, is that you have to abstain from alcohol, and sugar, refined sugar, and um, caffeine for a period of time. Oh, what's that period of time? So the training period, the days that you do your training in, as well as three weeks after. That is the time period that your brain waves need to become enduring and solid. So that would be the most important thing, to not use any of these substances that can break down these pathways before mm. they are settled. Okay. So the point is to live as healthy as you can, um, drink more water, you know, have a little more protein because it all helps to get these brain waves nice and solid. But other than that, your attitude towards the program, your willingness to want to change, that would be the magic. Um, so the, the, what makes the program seem magical is that we can talk to your brain and um, respond to its functioning within a 10,000th of a second. That is why we can change so many things in a shortish amount of time because we talk to your brain at its own speed. So it seems like magic but it's just technology um, that allows so us. Obviously people with learning difficulties, bad behaviors, yes. anger issues, addictions, yes, absolutely. Um, Alzheimer's, all of that. Um, you can help them. Yes. As you say, no guarantees. A lot depends on you as a person, as an individual. Yeah. But you have, I should imagine, uh, a proven track record. Where can people look at it? And what's your website address for people who maybe want to book, what, sure. maybe want to consult with you? Thank you so much. Um, we, we render our services to so many people. Um, we have about a 96% success rate. Right. Yeah, so sometimes you will find that people need more help than just brainwave balancing. They need chemical intervention or they need serious psychotherapy. How would you know that? If the, if the brain, after the brain training, there are still some issues, meaning that the brain is functioning at its optimal, but there's still issues, then it it means that more help is needed. Um, but yeah, we can do a reassessment afterwards and we can see how the numbers, the before and after compare. So we can measure 
how the changes have worked. Um, our website is brainharmonics.co.za. They can go and check out our Facebook page, which is also Brain Harmonics. We have so many things that they can see there. We have testimonials where people have spoken Brilliant. about how it changed them, how it worked for them. But yeah, basically, if you feel like you're not functioning at your best, and even if it's more serious, you know, it's worth a try. If someone's come to you for training, for a mapping of their brain and then training, yeah. are they good to go for the rest of their lives or would there be a point from time to time to come for a refresher? That is a very good question. It depends on their life. It depends on, on their um, stresses, their work, their, you know, if traumas happen, injury, things like that happen. Most people don't need to come back, but it depends on what happens, right? If you have a very stressful life, you have you run your own business, you might need to come for a top up like once a year or every, I have people who come every few months, um, people once every two years, just for a top up, just, you know, just saying to, to the brand, just, yeah, just to like, you know what, remember, no, don't stress so much. So it depends. Um, okay, each person is different. To it. Thank you yeah, indeed. No problem. Sounds magical, does it not? Well, visit the website. It is brainharmonics.co.za and you'll get all of the information. Give it a try. Who knows? It might just turn your life around. Don't go away. We're now in for a treat with the charismatic Tariq Malinga. And finally, my favorite part of the show today, we have the talented Tariq Uwais Malinga, who's in studio with us today. And of course, he's no stranger to ITV. He's uh, almost a staff member here. We see him so often, but always a pleasure. Mm -hmm. We're going to check with him what's been happening in his life the past year and what we can look forward to as far as the Nasheed scene is concerned. Salaamu Alaikum. Welcome to the program. Wa Alaikum Salaam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Lovely to have you once again in studio Absolutely. to talk about, Absolutely. alhamdulillah, your great successes. But just for people who might not have picked up on previous interviews, yes, yes. how did your journey start, Tariq? Um, you are now a household name, not only in South Africa, but all around the world. Absolutely. And Absolutely. you appear at a lot of uh, functions, fundraisers, etc. And you also have a lot of, um, uh, you also have a lot of uh, music. Yes that is for sale, alhamdulillah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how did your journey start? Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, my journey started uh, in 20, 20, 2012. That was my first album. But before that, what I can say was uh, I, I, I accepted Islam and I fell in love with nasheeds. I was like, wow, this is a different genre that I don't know. Of, of and it's so it's it's so beautiful it's connecting you to your creator mm -hmm. uh, I was two weeks old or three weeks as a Muslim and I had Zambika playing on radio Islam um, then the Nasheed was oh, what a wonderful world this would be and uh, so you know it became a habit that every day when they put Zain on radio or jump in as quick as possible, try and, and, and sing and sing along. And did you know at the time, uh, you know, when you, Alhamdulillah, when you embraced Islam, did you know that you had a strong singing voice? Were you told by friends and people around you that you should do something with your voice? Um, what, what I can say is that at home, I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the only boy. Uh, I got uh, three siblings, uh, Faiza, Masha and Leila. Uh, we all we all very talented. Alhamdulillah, Faiza is the one that once sang with Zain. Uh, right. Nasheed called where your servants ya Allah many years back as Zulu Nasheed. So uh, at that time I was still doing my hips, so I didn't really want to focus on Nasheed. Uh, and then in 2008, um, that's where I uh, someone came to me and said, you know what? Why don't you write your own Nasheed? Because every time in the Ulum. The, they would ask me to, to read Nasheed on Saturday evening. I would gather the boys around and read Nasheed. My principal, uh, his name is Karmosa Sidat uh, from Chibistan. Of course. He would every time call me to, the, to his office, uh, come and sing for me, and I sing so loud. <laughs> All this time right. I'm singing um, Zainbika's Nasheed, Ahmed Bukhater from uh, Arabia, uh, Sami Yusuf, all these guys, because I was so fond of 
the, the work that they're doing. It was beautiful. Um, so one day it came to me that, you know what, why don't I use this talent? Because I can sing. I know that I can sing. And people ask me to sing uh, different songs and I could sing them. I could imitate people. Why don't I just create my own path, my own journey, and be an inspiration to someone else who would like to be in a shit? That was the first uh, thing. The second thing was I wanted to change the concept the concept from our African people believe, or our people in Africa believing that Islam has a color. And uh, we don't have an Ashid artist who has rise so far uh, as, as, as in the Ashid platform. Though we don't have an Ashid um, uh, uh, production, uh, but you know, as an Ashid artist, there's certain ways that you need to try in order to, to rise. So I looked up to Zane so, uh, so much to the extent that um, in terms of writing, how would he write? In terms of singing, how would the song sound like? You know, I, I gather all these artists, uh, Maharze, I mean, Ahar, um, Semi Yusuf, Ahmed Bukhater, Zainbika, how would they write in a shit? And Alhamdulillah, I, 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 I became so good in writing that all my nashids are written by me. Alhamdulillah for that. Um, in all of this time, did you go for any training, any vocal training, or any training in writing music or anything? Was this just a gift <laughs> given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I must say that uh, this is a gift that every single day I say, Ya Allah, shukran for this gift. First, you gave me the gift of Islam, uh, and then from there, I became uh, someone who could write and express myself, and people get to listen to my work and I've never been to any school, a musical school or vocals, uh, nothing, absolutely nothing. Music is your life. Absolutely. Um, you're a young man. Alhamdulillah, you wait past the teenage years, so there yes. isn't a problem of your voice breaking. <laughs> yes. Because that's always a problem when, when kids start out very mm. young. You're trying They're going to find to, your voice. Yes, then their voice is going to change radically, mm. and they may or may not find a space in the Nasheed world. Yes. You didn't have that challenge. But what are the other challenges that you face, and how do you believe you're going to overcome them? <sighs> the Nasheed world is a tough world. It is, absolutely. You know, and it is. it's a very really small it is. market it as is. well. It is, it is. I'm not going to lie, it is. Um, one thing that helps me in terms of my challenges is the fact that I didn't, though I set a goal that this is where I want to be, but I don't rush it. I want it to take its own time. Uh, there are times in life or there are times where you feel as if like, you know, this is dragging me. It's 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 killing me. I'm I'm overworking myself. I'm I'm becoming restless over this because, for example, I I, I ran this for six years now, um, to where I wanted to be. It hasn't reached, but I I'm content with where how far I've came, because I know that there are people each and every day that would send salam, salamu alaikum, how are you, <laughs> alhamdulillah, how was your day, alhamdulillah, you know, this nashid that you sang like this, it actually changed my life. Every event that I go to, someone comes and say, you know what, this is what you've done in my life, and I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. So you know you're making a positive difference, Absolutely. alhamdulillah, but that doesn't mean there aren't challenges. Yes. Let's take a listen to one of your nasheeds and then go for an ad break, yes. and we'll come back and talk some more. Okay. The lovely always Malinga, always a pleasure to talk to him and always a pleasure to listen to him singing. So let's take a listen to the Nasheed and then we'll be back with you in a minute or two. interview or is he going to sing is he going to sing um Okay, because I said we're going to take a listen to the nasheed and we'll be back in a minute or two. All right, doesn't matter, leave it as it is. 
Uh, what are you going to sing? Uh, I'm just going to sing. Uh, Have you ever done Rise Up? Rise Up? No, I don't know. It. You don't know it? Oh, okay. <clears throat> I don't have to say anything. I've said it. Just pan on him straight away. Yeah, Bismillah. You're going to look there and you're going to start singing. Okay. Should I say the name of the machine? Sorry. Okay, you finish singing. Okay. Uh, I don't have to. Yeah, okay. When you finish singing, you look at me and then we go into the second part of our interview. Okay, okay. صلى الله عليه محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وقتولا ما بيجو يا أم بروفيتي وتو محمد إذا بسيسو زجا الله Mazibeguye, King of Medina. Gite ugotola, magobeguye, un profeti wetu Muhammad. Izibu siso, ziga Allah, mazibeguye, King of Medina. Sallallahu alayhi Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallallahu alayhi Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Anta Nur, the guiding light. Ya Allah, Antanur, the guiding light. Teach me love, but I don't know. Show me the way and I should go. Alone I stumble and fall. Take my hand and light my way. Save me from myself so I can live for you. Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi, Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya the guiding light Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi Ya Allah, Ya Rabbi Ya Allah MashaAllah I'm so fortunate that I get to hear you live in the studio That is absolutely wonderful Um you also, I haven't spoken to you for over a year. Now that you're back, I'm wondering about the collaborations that you've entered into. Yeah. The last time we spoke, um, we had, I think, you shot something with Samia Issa. Samia Issa, yes. Samia at the... Uh, was at, at the, Turkish Mosque. That's Turkish Turkish correct, Turkish yes. Mosque, yeah. So what's happened since then? Uh, uh, and then I, I, I got the opportunity to work with Brother Zain, uh, Zain Bika. Alhamdulillah, um, we worked on two nasheeds together. Uh, the one that I just sang now, it's called King of Medina. Send my salam to the King of Medina. And the second one... And that's in English and Zulu. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. English and Zulu. And the second one was Dare to Believe. Uh, we did a nasheed um, uh, dedicated to the Rohingya people. Um, it says, if you dare to believe that one heart can heal another, one hand can lift us high, uh, can lift us high, uh, higher. So Alhamdulillah, uh, from there, I've also ha happened to work with um, young upcoming Nasheed artists. Uh, I've got over plus minus 20 upcoming Nasheed on the list already. 
Um, I worked with one already from Lodium also. Is the Nasheed, the Nasheed is called um, Allah is enough for me. Alhamdulillah, it's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And then um, other uh, recordings are still coming up. There's one guy from Africa, I forgot his name. He's from Uganda. We're doing a, nash a humanitarian nasheed. It's called Africa Together as One. A beautiful one also, alhamdulillah. And besides that, I also have been doing a lot of uh, events. I just came back from Durban now. Um, uh, it's called Hello Durban Halal Foods Expo. <laughs> uh, beautiful event also, alhamdulillah. So there's still more events coming up. Alhamdulillah, it's a beautiful journey. Beautiful. So, sure, <coughs> things are working out very well for you. But we also know there are lots of young, upcoming Nasheed artists. Absolutely. You have been able to go on and make this your life's work. Yes. But not everyone else is able to do that. Um, what, what would your advice be to people wanting to enter the space? But before we carry on, let's go for an ad break. Okay. I'm talking to Tariq Uwais Malinga. He's bringing us up to speed as to where he is at this point in life. Alhamdulillah, he's just spoken about uh, his collaboration with Zain Bika. Let's go for an ad break. When we come back, we'll talk some more and take another listen or a listen to another Nasheed from uh, Tariq Uwais Malinga. Welcome back, and it's almost the end of the show. My word, time really does fly by when you're listening to the melodious tones of Tariq Malinga. We're going to get him to respond to my final question, which I asked uh, just before the break. And inshallah, I'm not going to leave you alone. We're going to play out with a live rendition of another nasheed by brother Tariq Uwais Malinga. So my question about this very competitive small space and the sheet art space. What's your advice to young people? Um. I know uh, uh, out there, there's a lot of young upcoming machine artists. They're very talented. Um, and the only advice that I always give them is that, you know, they, the most important thing is finding your voice and finding who you are. No one can break you from that. No one can, if you know who you are and where you're heading to, because finding your voice, you, you don't, you're not trying to imitate anybody else. You're trying to be you and you're trying to tell your story. Do not write a book that's already been written to rewrite it. Make your own book and try by all, by all means to be authentic. Be yourself. Do not let people change you that, no, you know what? You don't sing well. You they try to be like this. Don't do that. Be yourself, mm -hmm. and you will see the, the success from it. Mm -hmm. But obviously, it's not a huge market. So for the majority of youngsters who want to enter the space, they're going to do it out of love. Absolutely. Not necessarily to make um, a full-time, lifelong career yes. out of it. Absolutely. A few will be lucky enough, but for the rest, it's going to be just out of the sheer love of Nasheed uh, singing. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. And finally, before you go on to our closing Nasheed for the morning, what do you want to say to our viewers and Nasheed artists and Nasheed lovers? Um, to all the viewers, the Nasheed lovers, first I would like to say shukran jazakallah for always supporting my Nasheeds. Um, and this, throughout this journey, being with me throughout this journey, it is, it is a, a beautiful journey. And alhamdulillah, you'll make my dream possible. And I hope that you're going to make someone else's dream possible. So let's support each other as for the love of Allah. And we are trying to spread, uh, to spread the message. Uh, so let's support each other, inshallah. Uh, and we will see the success, inshallah. Inshallah, Amin, And that's where we're going to have to leave it. But like I said, I'm not leaving you alone now. We're going to play out with a live performance by Brother Tariq Uwais Malinga. Please take care on the roads. A big thank you to the production team. Until the next time, as always, it is Assalamu Alaikum. And Khudafiz from me, Julie Ali. And over to Tariq Malinga. Bismillah. Bismillah rahman rahim uh, The next nasheed I'm going to do, Inshallah, this is one of my favorite nasheed that I always do um, these are the 99 names of Allah the beautiful names of Allah inshallah bismillahir rahmanir rahim <coughs> Oh, 
ले अलबरे अलमोसवेर अलगफ़ार अलगहार अलगहार सुबहानल्लाह Yeah. 